my graduates from my school being Forbes. Bag drop. Bag drop. <laughs> a mic drop. Bag drop. Bag drop. All right, guys, welcome back. EYL, this is going to be a fun episode. Very, very educational. I can feel it. Damn. This is something that we've been looking forward to for a while. So, you know, um, one of the main initiatives for this year is to focus more on tech because, uh, you know, we talk about tech so much on when it comes to stocks, market Mondays mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But we haven't really had a lot of tech entrepreneurs previously. Um, so this year we wanted to highlight tech entrepreneurs and especially, if, you know, it's always a good when we can do black tech entrepreneurs. So this is what we're going to do today. And Ruben Harris, somebody that was introduced to me probably over a year ago. Shout out to my man, Jason, um, Jason Lewis. So he actually was telling me about you. Then he actually introduced me to Shireen. And then she introduced me to you. And um, here we are now. So Ruben, young entrepreneur, CEO of career karma so career karma is a company that actually matches candidates up with jobs in the in the tech industry correct with job training programs. job training programs in the, and then we help them find a job in the, in the tech industry um so just closed the series b right so series b. 40 million dollars 40 million dollars 52 in the last three years yeah. <laughs> so yeah just let's, let's not go also over that. yeah raise <laughs> raise 52 million dollars in the last two years um currently has over 200 employees 200 employees on contract this year mm -hmm. um 23 countries nine states yeah right and um eight figures in revenue correct three million people <laughs> visit the site every month three yes. three million um <laughs> organic that's right that's right um people that visit the site Every month, am I missing anything? I think you funneled 20, over twenty five thousand. Twenty five. I got you, you really? about, Okay, Listen, you, got you run up on us all the time, bro. I know you, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tw we're introducing twenty five thousand people a month to job training programs. <laughs> and and it's so Jason. So like this is actually a real testimony because Jason is a, he's from our neighborhood, a friend of mine, and um, he actually went through the job training program. Mm -hmm. And so that's why when he connected me, he was like, yo, I actually, like, he actually went through it. I'm not sure exactly what happened after that, but he was so, um, you know, enthusiastic about it. Mm -hmm. That's what actually made him actually reach out to me and was like, have you ever heard of this? This is somebody that you got to highlight because it's so great. Da, 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 da. Um, so I just, before we even start the episode, word of mouth is always the best form of marketing. Yes. And doing a good job by people is always mm -hmm. the best form of marketing because you never know who knows who. And um, that was a way that, you know, all of this gets connected is that, you know, he actually goes through the job training program and um, is really, really excited about it, feels good about it, and then connects the dots. So, yeah. And we just kept seeing you everywhere. Yeah, I mean, we, it's, it's good people find good people. Yeah, you know? yeah, I found like, I'm like, oh, Ruben's here again. Oh, Ruben's here again. Yeah. Oh, Ruben's, and then obviously yeah. you got and like Shereen and Jason kept saying, hey, earn your leisure, earn your leisure. Every time I seen you guys, it's bigger and bigger and bigger. I was like, oh, <laughs> this, is, this is not just a business, this is a movement. Yeah. I want to be part of that. No, I appreciate <laughs> it. So yeah, so this is going to be a dope conversation. Like I said, we're going to talk about his start and starting a tech company. Silicon Valley, the ups and downs, raising money, um, the road to a billion dollar valuation, all of the angel investors that you you know need to know about, all of that stuff. So first and foremost, welcome. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's get into this. So how do you get into starting a tech company when you don't have a, you're not a tech guy originally, right? Like you don't have a tech background. I don't have a tech background. I'm not a software engineer. Um, what, what is your background? What were you doing before this? So I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. Shout out to um, Atlanta. I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm a musician. I've been playing the cello since I was four years old. A cello? Yeah. I've been playing the cello since I was four years old. So Specialty. That's a specialty. It's, it's a different, it's a different <laughs> instrument. Um, but um, you know, I was growing up, I wanted to become the best musician in the world. So I did a lot of student musician work, things like that. Um, my cello teacher is the one who told me to actually get into business because a lot of artists don't understand business. They sign up to a lot of bad deals. They don't understand what's going on. And so I found a course online where I was able to teach myself financial modeling, kind of like UIL University. Mm -hmm. Became an investment banker, um, and that worked out very well. Uh, very quickly, the, the tech world started taking over the technology, the finance world, and one of our buddies, he quit the investment bank and became a software engineer. 
when I was in investment banking, I met uh, one of my co-founders, Archer Meister, and his twin brother, and none of us knew how to code. And Atlanta Tech Village had popped up across the street. Um, and we were like, what's this tech thing that's happening? And everybody kept talking about Silicon Valley. There was a company called BitPay across the street. Oh, I know that at the same time that Coinbase was starting mm-hmm. early on. So we saw crypto very, very early days. And we were like, if we want to start a company, like you said, if you want to start a billion dollar company, it has to have tech at its core. But none of us knew how to code. And that guy that quit the bank and became a software engineer, he did it in three months. He went to something called a boot camp, which is a job training program. And so that, that boot camp had a guy named Jack Altman, who runs a company called Lattice today, who was also an investment banker. He did the boot camp and he was a software engineer. And his brother was Sam Altman, who was the president of Y Combinator at the time, which we'll talk about in a second. Mm-hmm. And that's when we learned that there's these accelerators that will train you to be entrepreneurs, and there's these boot camps that will train you, even if you didn't go to college, to get six figures and then teach you how to build billion dollar companies. And the two things, where I'll pause here, that Y Combinator says is if you want to start a billion dollar company, you have to write code and you have to talk to users. So my co founders decided they're going to be the right code guys, and I was going to be the talk to users guy, which is the CEO and the person that sells. So that's where it started. All right. So. We've we've heard Y Combinator before. Um, yeah. Shout out to Players Lounge. Yeah, uh, one of the companies that we actually covered on on uh, Anulisia. Your partners, you knew them pr- at, from the bank, and they you guys moved and went to Y Combinator all together. How did that process take place? We didn't go to Y Combinator immediately. Um, it's harder to get into Y Combinator than Stanford. Well, let's 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 just talk about because some people might not have seen that episode. Can you explain what Y Combinator is? So Y Combinator is the world's largest tech accelerator. So in the last 16 years, they've generated 300 billion in value. So companies like Airbnb, Stripe, Dropbox, DoorDash, that was all created through Y Combinator. So what they do is they'll let anybody apply. There's two cohorts a year. And if you get accepted, they'll give you money. In our case, it was $150,000. They take 7%. And then you're, you're part of a network, a club of all the other Y Combinator companies. So there's over 2,000 Y Combinator companies. So I can email any CEO in the network and we're fam and we look out for each other and essentially they help you raise money, um, which is how I was able to learn how to raise all this money. And then you're able to get mentors that help you execute after you raise money to build and solve problems that you've set out to do. So so Tim, and are they, they you're the, the person that decided you're gonna go to Y Combinator? So, what happened is, so we said we wanted to do Y Combinator, but to get to the point where you're in Y Combinator, yeah. our philosophy was like, rather than go straight into uh, starting a company, let's work at tech companies first. And rather than work for the same tech company, let's actually learn the game first. Mm-hmm. And and in the same amount of time, let's take three years and split up. So Archer, he decided to go to a FinTech marketplace called Funding Circle. So he went there early. Timor, he was at Auto Trader at the time, which is a car marketplace. And then he wanted to get into augmented reality, so he went to Blipper. And then I went to an education company uh, called Alt School, and then a healthcare company called Honor, and then a political company called um, Hustle. And so we all spent time during that period learning our skills. So I focus on sales. They focus on software engineering. My brother also went to a boot camp. He became a software engineer at a health at a healthcare company, and we did that for about three years. And then we organized a bunch of events um, in the in the city of San Francisco that I learned about uh, to build my network. And then we eventually started the company. All right. So everybody decided, look, I got a skill. Let me go master it. Mm-hmm. You have a skill. Go master it. You got yep. a skill. Go master it. Let's come back together. Mm-hmm. Like form. a backwards version of the Wu Tang Clan. Yeah. yeah right. Right. I started together, and then they eventually split. Gotcha. We split, and then came back together. That's, that's real teamwork. So yeah. all right. So when you start in it, you have one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Mm-hmm. as startup did you have any other money outside of that or that was like the so that's a good question um when we applied to y combinator so this is this is actually an interesting story so i told you i was a musician i did studio musician work i did stuff with like zaytoven i did stuff with tricking the dream all these different people um that's how i got into like the club space so i did i used to promote parties with uh, studio 72 and jermaine dupree stuff like that i took that same philosophy in atlanta this is how i met michael seibel i did a i noticed that they people kept saying there's no black people in tech so and a lot of the events were like real boring so i did a big party at a club in san francisco called infusion lounge kind of like the event that you and i met in oakland Mm -hmm. um and 
I made sure that instead of having celebrities, we had founders and CEOs. And uh, one of the people that was there was Michael Seibel, who is now the CEO of a combinator that started Twitch. It was a beautiful event. And when Michael met us, he pretty much was like, hey, you guys should start a company. Um, let us know. And at the time, we actually started a- <laughs> That's the conversation. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. Start, let <laughs> you me know. start a company, like, I see what you're doing. You're out here like- Have a good night. <laughs> yeah, pretty, pretty much. He, he started Twitch? He started Twitch, yeah. Oof. So Michael Sapp was a black man. Yeah, 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 yeah definitely. Shout out to Mike. Yeah, so, and, and what's, what's interesting is that, um, similar to you guys, when we came, when we got our first jobs in technology, we wrote a story about it called Breaking Into Startups that took off and then it turned into a podcast. And so when Michael was like, you need to start a company, we was like, we started this podcast. He was like, have you quit your job though? Are you doing it full time? Like you guys, right? I wasn't doing it like that. He was like, I said, no. He said, well, you're not ready yet. So check it out. I quit my job to go full time. We applied to Y Combinator, got rejected. I'm like Mike, what's going on? <laughs> and so he goes, he said, start a company, man. <laughs> so he says, so he says, he says, you're the CEO, right? I said, yeah. He said, go raise some. So I, I set out to raise 150,000. Um, I ended up raising 300,000 in two weeks. And then I applied to Y Combinator again and then got in and then eventually had about half a million before we, when we were going through the cohort, so, yeah. How do you apply for Y Combinator? You li literally just apply, you go to like ycombinator.com slash apply, and it breaks down what you gotta do. So, the reason we didn't get in the first time, personally, I believe, is because I didn't do the best job of communication. One of the biggest things, and this is this is important, not just for entrepreneurship, but even career navigation in general, is like, you wanna explain, what do you do very clearly what problem are you solving for who how often do they have that problem um how are you solving it through software and when you solve it how do you make money how much traction do you have have you launched are you going at it full time who's technical on your team what market are you addressing how big is that market those are essentially like the 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 foundational questions that they'll be asking you and it's very similar to like when you're trying to apply for a company they're not looking to see if you actually know how to code or know how to sell they're looking to see like who are you and how can you solve problems for me at this company so okay so all right so you go through and then one other thing about why comedy is that it's also something where like other successful tech founders come and speak to you guys right yeah it's like a, it's like a a camp almost right yeah how, how long is it like, three months three months but three you got to live there right you yeah everybody comes to san francisco san everybody francisco. comes to san francisco um it has gone more virtual now because of covid of the pandemic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but um everybody goes to san francisco um you have different cohorts you meet every week and then they have dinners and stuff yeah you meet other other people are teaching you the game it's like it's straight it's like it's a boot camp it's just it's a it's a boot camp for entrepreneurs. Same thing that we're talking about job training programs to get a job in tech. It's the same thing for entrepreneurs after you've like learned the game. Yeah, yeah. So, so very important. If anybody's interested, definitely check it out. So all right, so so now you have the money. You you pass the you go through Y Combinator. Um, you go to different. You learn from different. You know careers, but you still have the five hundred thousand dollars that you saved mm -hmm. originally, right? You didn't blow that money. Didn't blow it, but you definitely had to spend some of it. You spent it before you started the company. I spent it to run the company. It didn't. I didn't blow it all. So, like, at what point so, do you actually so, start so, the company? So when you're when you're you've already started the company when you apply to YC. Some okay. people will apply with just an idea, but there's a really good quote that Michael says is like, "You're nothing until you launch." All right. Everybody can apply with an idea that they launch, even if they don't know how to code. There's a lot of amazing no-code tools like Bubble, like uh, Webflow. You don't even have to code. You could literally just be like, what problem do I want to solve? And just make an MVP, which is a minimum viable product, mm -hmm. and just like try it. And um, when you're in there, they give you the money to continue running it because what you're doing during those three months is trying to make it grow as fast as possible so you look as best as possible. So when you present on something called Demo Day, which is the end of it, yeah, yeah, you yeah. literally have the biggest investors in the world that you're presenting to and billions of dollars change hands. Oh, yeah. Talk, yeah, talk, yeah, about, yeah. talk about that. because but before, you, before you do Demo Day, because that, that's huge, I want to... Mm -hmm. 
when you were thinking about this, right, and the number one question you said was like, what problem are you trying to solve? Yes. At that point, like, what was the problem that you were trying to solve? That's a good question. So we want to really focus on on career navigation. So when I saw that my brother was able to get a job making 150000 in five months without going to college, I saw my co-founders do the same thing, my sister started to study, I was like, what would happen if the world knew that there's these job training programs that exist that help millions and billions of people get money but more importantly, skills that allow them to build solutions to problems for their own family, but eventually start their own companies where they're not dependent on anybody else. Did you know that the black community has $2.7 trillion of spending power? Are you ready to see what you can do when you combine and recirculate our resources to expand the pool of black excellence? I know I'm ready. And that's why we've partnered with Greenwood, the in-demand black-owned digital banking platform. Greenwood's namesake was founded in 1906, built from the brilliance of black dreamers looking to create a self-sufficient community in the Greenwood district of Tulsa, Oklahoma, a.k.a. Black Wall Street. Today, Greenwood is a digital banking platform with the mission to strengthen the black dollar using the same community reinvestment strategies of the original Greenwood district. And it's powered by a best-in-class mobile app that allows you to bank from anywhere. So, earners. If you're ready to build a new legacy of black economic achievement, go to bankgreenwood.com slash EYL and sign up to be a part of the new Greenwood community. That's bankgreenwood.com slash EYL. Don't wait. Don't hesitate. Head over there now. And the biggest reason why I thought that we didn't know about these things is because we've never been exposed to it, which is why media was so important, which is why we started a podcast. And so... The, the first step was like, how do we create the number one destination for career advice on the internet so people are aware of the opportunities that exist? What we realized is that even if you expose people to these career paths, like we did on the podcast, some people will take the initiative that are like super driven and have the psychological confidence to do it. But most people need a community of people behind them to help them. And so we wanted to make sure that people had peers, coaches, and mentors to make sure that they don't, don't just start a program, but they finish it. Mm -hmm. And then once they're done with the training, there's a lot of people that are extremely intelligent, have the best degrees in the world, have gone to the best training programs that still struggle in the job search. Why? Because they don't know how to communicate. They don't know how to tell their story. And so we need to help them with that. So we have this network of companies. We have live audio rooms in our community to be able to connect people directly to companies. And so the short answer is, we're the easiest way to find a job training program online that is now growing to become the world's largest community career transitioners on the internet that will eventually become the world's largest staffing firm. So, um, two questions. When he said um, to raise the money, how did you? who did you raise the money from and how did you go about raising the money? Great question. First thing that he said is like, what is the bare minimum amount of money that you need in order to survive? San Francisco is one of the most expensive places to live. We had about four four of us that were living in one place. The rent was like seven thousand a month, and we like broke down the math, and without paying ourselves, like we're like we just need one hundred fifty thousand. Um, so, <laughs> so, so, so the 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 um what we did in order to um find who the initial people were going to be, I just leveraged the people that I met through working at companies that I knew that were investors. Um, but I didn't just focus on the traditional angel investors or traditional entrepreneurs, I reached out to people that I know that were accomplished that will cut a check as well. Um, one of the people I met at Atlanta Tech Village was a guy named Paul Judge. Oh yeah, oh, Paul Judge so, from Greenwood. Yeah, so, Friend of the show. Yeah, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah Paul, Judge, Paul Judge cut a check very early. Uh, Arlen Hamilton from Backstage cut a check very early. Michael Seibel cut a check very early. Um, and what I was able to do, as I was able to be like, pretty much within the first few days, say 50% of the round is full with people that I already knew. And then I used that and been like, hey, look, there's only a week left. Are you in? <laughs> right? And the, I got the rock stars here. I want you in. Are you in or out? And I kind of like created this whole FOMO type of thing. But a lot of the stuff that I learned through investment banking around putting together a presentation um, really helped me a lot. There's a, if for anybody that's putting together pitches, because I get this question a lot, Go to Sequoia Business Plans. Check it out. They, they explain the flow. Sequoia is one of the biggest venture capital firms. For the people that don't know what a venture capital firm is, it's um, people that give you money to start companies, kind of like Shark Tank. Um, so Sequoia Business Plans. And then watch this video called Think Big, Start Small by Jim Getz. That really broke down how to tell my vision or our vision for, for what we want to do. 
And then, okay, that's so yeah, that's actually the scarcity model. And then also using like you have like Paul Judge, who's highly respected. So once he gives money, that automatically gives credibility to it. Yeah. So what you do is like once you get your first few checks, right? So you always wanna you wanna you wanna stack all your meetings back to back, right? So I would do like. And the, this is early days. Early days was just like five meetings a day. Now, since we got Zoom, I'll do like 10, 15 meetings in a day. But like you want to do as many meetings back to back to back. And then you want to follow up with all your material. Your material got to be tight. You got to have your deck, your data room, your financial model, just everything like really, really clean. And then um, let's say that somebody cuts a check. You follow up with people that may not have responded to you. and be like, hey, just bumping this up to catch up to see what's going on. Well, I'll let you know this other person's in. Um, and it's about to close. So you just want to keep keep following up like that. So yeah. And then all right. So the second part of the question is, can you explain what the was it pitch day at Y Combinator? Demo, demo, demo day. Demo day. What's, explain so what that demo is. day. So so something that I really like about Y Combinator is that they bet on first time founders. Right. A lot of people don't. They, they weren't born um, with a network that. Well, they're not privileged, right? I, I, I didn't have this network coming in here. And so what they'll do is literally give you credibility so that you can raise money. Mm -hmm. Not saying that it's impossible without it, but, and there's other accelerators like 500 Startups and Techstars. Y well, Combinator is the most known for this, but essentially they bet on you. And what they'll do is they'll create hype. So what's interesting about Y Combinator is every cohort, so they do a summer batch and a winter batch, has two to three companies that go public. So the whole world knows that Y Combinator is so good at picking companies and being selective on who applies that there will be multiple billion dollar companies in each batch. So what they do is they create a huge event where all the biggest investors come and essentially create a lot of FOMO as well. So and, there, and what a lot of investors will try to do, will try to get to the founders earlier before demo day and we're encouraged to like wait until demo day so that you can present and then have the highest valuation, which is important so you're not diluting yourself, which means giving away too much ownership. Yeah, let's talk about that. So like yeah. obviously the demo day, I'm sure it was a nerve wracking day, but you prepared for it. That was the first one. On stage two. <laughs> first one the first to go. First one in person in San Francisco. How, how, how many people at that moment after with the presentation, do they invest right on the spot? How does that work? And, and when you spoke about valuation, how was it measured there? And if people don't know, can you tell them how people or how valuations are actually calculated? Some people do invest on the spot. Um, so, you know, whenever you present a demo day, you're going to get a lot of people that are going to follow up and show interest. And then it's on you to follow up with all of them. For every founder, it's different. But just some people will do their deal beforehand. It really it's up to you. They don't. Y Combinator doesn't tell you what you have to do. They just give you advice and it's up to you to take that advice or not. Um, from a valuation perspective, markets are crazy, like especially right now. The market valuation right now is way higher than it was when I was going through Y Combinator. But just to understand like quick and dirty valuation stuff, usually it's a function of um, 10x of your revenue. So like if you're, I don't know, making 10 million a year, 10x is like $100 million valuation. Um, but usually YC companies aren't at that stage, that's actually a later stage. Um, usually a lot of people are pre-revenue, um, have some traction, but not a ton of traction. Um, I think when we were when we were at in Y Combinator, just so people have perspective, I'll just give the number, we were at 13,000 a month, just, that was a long time ago. And yeah. <laughs> way, way, way back. Way back, <laughs> way back, it's so long ago. And, uh, and what, what's interesting is that um, you know, it's not just about your revenue traction. So you're usually, in, you want to be, Y Combinator encourages you to make sure you have monthly revenue growth. The only difference between startups and like everything else is is a growth and momentum. So you want to be growing 10 to 20% monthly from a revenue perspective. Not everybody's doing that, but like you want to just have that number in your head because, you know, compounding is, is, is key. Mm -hmm. But you're not just going to be evaluated on revenue. You're going to be evaluated on who's your team. Do not apply to Y Combinator unless you have somebody that's technical. I'm not technical. My co-founders are technical. We knew that. If they decided they weren't going to be technical, I had to be technical. And the reason why is because you don't want to be outsourcing your code to other people. It gets expensive and it's just you don't have control about what's going on. So I'm going to be evaluating your team. Um, outside of technicals, they're going to be like, 
have you experienced this problem before? So like if you're helping people get good credit, like have you had bad credit before and have you gotten out of it? So do you, are you personally invested in this? There's a difference between a job, a career, and a calling. This is a calling to me because mm. I've been through this before, right? So have you done this before? Um, who is your investor so far, right? Uh, what does your software look like? Um, and, and many other things. And so essentially, um, when you think about valuation, another way to think about it is, is there a 1% chance likelihood of achieving this valuation? And all the other factors are like, can increase that percentage chance of reaching the valuation. Make sense? Gotcha. And so whenever you're raising money um, from investors, they're actually going to be investing to own a piece of your company. So the more money that you raise, if it's a low valuation, then like you actually like lose more mm -hmm. of your company. Um, but usually you could think about, you're probably gonna be giving up about 20% of your company in the beginning. Yeah, and that's key, because most people, like they'll dilute the company and give away ownership before they've ever made money. Mm -hmm. By the time they've raised it, they don't have, they're, they're not majority anymore. Some people have no choice because they haven't been executing and growing their company, right? So you also gotta make sure your company doesn't die, all right? So for the people that are looking to raise money, just be careful what you wish for. Like if you if you decide that you're gonna raise money, you're not raising money to build a hundred million dollar company. Like I know you guys think in bees. I think in bees <laughs> too, right? You know, we tell, we don't. One of my my mentors said, "Don't tell billions, tell trillions." Right? To create these like ten hundred billion dollar companies, you have to think very very big. And if you're not thinking like that, don't invest. Don't raise money from venture capital. You could just start a lifestyle business and you could do friends and family stuff. It's not for everybody. So, And just to wrap up the Y comedy, the conversation, they, so the the gentleman that runs it, he's black, right? Michael Sabo. Yeah. Um, and how many people get accepted per year? It depends. The cohorts are a little bit bigger now. Um, our cohort, I believe, had about 200 companies that were in there. Um, but like, in the beginning, it was like 10, 10 people, but out of the 200, it's usually a, a much smaller percentage. So yeah, it's about 200 companies a year. So it's, it's a good amount of people, and it's not just in the US that you have Latin America, you have Africa. You, we talked about global stuff earlier, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it's, it's from everywhere. It doesn't matter where you're located. So you, And there's some people that have applied seven times, right? Drop, Dropbox is a good example of a company that got rejected the first time as well. Um, and there's a lot of people that give up if they get rejected, which is, I think is a very important thing to understand even in career navigation as well. Dropbox, Airbnb. Stripe, Stripe DoorDash. Stripe don't exist. Um, Rappi, yeah. Deal. Like, Those are all people that came from. Yeah, just look at Y Combinator and you'll see like they, they got hitters, yeah. Very important for people to understand and to know, you know, you don't know what you don't know. You don't know what you don't and, know. And, um, you know, that's what the, the whole platform is to educate people. So any tech founders that's looking for you know startup help uh, look into Y Combinator yes and it's actually being run by a black man so yeah one more thing uh, before YC you mentioned like we talked a little bit about the angels there are different types of funds so in the beginning you're going to be looking at pre-seed funds and seed funds that are usually going to be cutting checks anywhere between like on the lowest end like I don't know 10,000 Twenty-five thousand up to like maybe half a million at most, like a million dollar checks. So you have seed funds and pre-seed funds, but also take advantage of the diversity funds that are out there. Take advantage of the funds that are focused on women in tech. Take advantage of the impact funds. Can you talk about that a little bit? So one one of our investors is uh, Emerson Collective, right? So that's uh, uh, Lorene Powell Jobs, right? Mm -hmm. So so it's a big fund. Who's it? Lorene Powell Jobs. Steve Jobs is yes. ex wife? Yeah. Widow. Yeah. Widow. And um and so she um and she uh has a multi multi billion dollar fund, right? And she's impact focused investor. So uh in the beginning they gave us a six hundred thousand dollar check. All right. But we have another fund like um imaginable futures. What is the impact investor? So they're they're usually family offices. So like um imaginable futures is another investor. So they're the eBay founder, Piero Midiar. So multi-billion billionaire as well. So he cut a check as well into this round. There's um, the founders of Paylocity. So they're usually just wealthy people that want to invest in people that want to do good. Mm. And what's cool about these days in people that want to start companies, at least our generation, 
we don't just want to create something that just makes a lot of money. We're focused on solving problems that are for the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. What you all are doing with EIL, EIL with uh, financial literacy, is like one of the most important issues out here for our people. And people will fund that type of stuff all day long. And same thing with us, like career navigation, career development. Like if, if we don't help our people get tech skills, like we're gonna continue to be digital cotton pickers forever because we're driving all this value for everybody else's platforms, but we're not creating our own. And the jobs that we have, like at warehouses or in retail companies, they're gonna be taken over by robots. And what are you gonna do after that? So gotta figure it out. Yeah, you, you, you spoke about something that I'm sure people, if they read and they hear us talk a lot, they hear seed round, seed round. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what an actual seed round is and how many seed rounds are needed or if they are needed to raise a certain amount of capital? Running a company is like running a child, right? So it's a, a raising a child. It's not like um, there's a, a book to raise kids, even though there are books to raise kids. Um, <laughs> True. That give you guys, <laughs> yeah. right? And so think about the, the rounds kind of like in the beginning, like a friend and family round. Right, so you're gonna hit. Th these days, we can take advantage of really cool things on like the internet. Where, let's pretend that you know you might hit up everybody in the neighborhood over here to give money, but then like you ran out of people that you know. You can leverage crowdfunding, things like AngelList and WeFunder and stuff like that, uh, so that you can raise money from doctors and lawyers that want to invest into tech companies. That's usually going to be a f what you call a friends and family round. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe music executives, athletes, or stuff like that. And then you have your uh, pre-seed round that you might have an institutional investor, which will include somebody's like funds that I was telling you about before. Like one of ours is like Unshackled Ventures. They um they um invest in immigrants, so that's a, like a really good one. Mm -hmm. um, um, then you and Capor Capital. Capor Capital is like a impact investor, but they also invest in in like. Uh, Twilio, for example, and Uber, and many other things like that. So they have, they have big hits that they've that they've done very well. Um, and then after that, you'll do like your seed round, then Series A, Series B, all the way till you go public. Going back to what you said about um, valuation, if you want to build a billion dollar company, usually when you're raising your Series A, you're going to be in the two million dollar a year range for the Series A. Making two million over. Making two million, yeah. There's a difference between raising money and making money. I'm glad that you called that out because too many times people are celebrating raising money and I think it's very important for us to not highlight just that, which I love that you guys did with your intro where we're focused on solving the problem, whatever. Make sure that you're actually rate, making money as well. And two million a year is like the baseline for the A. Then you wanna remember these, three, these five numbers, triple, triple, double, double, double. Right, so, so if you go your next year, you want to be shooting for six million. The year after that, eighteen million. The year after that, thirty-six, seventy-two, and then this one has some flexibility because then it's one hundred forty-four. But like at a hundred million a year, then you're a billion dollar company. That's probably when you're going to go public. Yeah, because once you get the hundred, ten exit, you got to a billion. That's right. Gotcha. And you know these days, you you're seeing. 20, 30, 50, 100x revenue multiples. That was like the end of 2021. Now 2022, you see what's going on with the public markets. Uh, well, you know, well, so something's a, a, a little, it's a little cool, cool, cooler, yeah. but it'll come back. But like, so when we spoke to John Henry, he was saying that, you know, um, depending on what kind of company it could have, it could even have much higher. Oh yeah. So like any AI mm -hmm. is like 20%, 25%, well, I depends. mean 25 times. It depends. Um, yeah, so valuation. It, it really depends. Like you have to like look at, okay, what are the public company comparables? This is where like the investment banking knowledge comes in. Like so, you know, investors are like, are like pattern matchers. So like, what could this company be? Right? What's the future of it? So like something that we would say all the time is like we're like booking dot com for your career mm. because that's your comparable. That's my comparable. It's <laughs> a very big one, right? Yeah. Um, but there's others, like if I have the community side of things, there's like uh, Duolingo, which is public, right? And they have a big community piece where there's like over 500 million monthly active users but a very small percentage of them that they monetize, right? Um, you have Zillow as well, which is a marketplace um, and, and many other things like that. And so to your point, you know, depending on which company that you're trying to evaluate, uh, compare yourself against, you wanna be 
have an understanding of not just public companies, but also private companies as well. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, so I'm thinking like now, if they're looking at like an EYL university, they mm -hmm. might say like, that could be the next Chegg or something like that. Yeah, Chegg, yeah, it's a good one. Chegg, Coursera, right. Udemy, that just went public. Exactly, okay, exactly. Gotcha, gotcha. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, all right, so now, going back to career karma. So you, 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 you go through all of that, now, what's the beginning stages of actually getting career karma up and yeah. running to where it is now? Such a good question. Um, one of the first one of the first things that they teach you at YC is um, doing things that don't scale, right? So a lot of people, even though they encourage you to like have a technical co-founder, they go straight into coding a solution for the problem. In the beginning, you want to do things that are manual, right? So what's the first thing that we did? We started inviting people to our house and be like, yo, pull up. What's going on? What what what's your career goal? What's your number one problem? And what's your timeline? Oh, talk about so you said that they teach you to do things that aren't scalable? In the beginning. Why is that? So that you could really understand the pain points all the way. Mm. All right. This is a very important this is a real so Paul Graham and Jessica Livingston started Y Combinator for if you want to really learn the game read us all free essays Paul Graham's essays it's literally like the startup bible like read that there's also how to start a startup by Sam Altman read that read zero to one by Peter Thiel I got that on my book list fire, fire. <laughs> like that all teaches you the game on how to think about this stuff and that's all the stuff that I start studying but doing things that don't scale is like one of the most important concepts to understand because it gets you in the trenches to know what's going on it's like what you guys are doing now through doing all these interviews and talking to people, it's like when we started the podcast, I knew the pain points that people felt consistently in addition to my own personal pain points going through it. So then I knew what the MVP was supposed to look like, right? And what you do is, let's say that I don't want to coach something and I want to do a paper wireframe. I could literally draw up mock-ups of what it would look like in an app and be like, hey, would you use this? And try it. And then you will be watching him to see how he's using it, where he gets stuck, where he's confused, and then you can like iterate on it. And then once you have an understanding of like how it works, then you start coding stuff up. Yeah, right? So if you scale too fast, you might miss some of those pain points. You miss some of those pain you, points. That could the, just be detrimental. The, the, the ability to talk to your users is one of the most magical things. You always want to be writing code and you always want to be talking to users. And a lot of people, after they raise money, they stop talking to people. They stop talking to their users and they just get caught up in running the business, which is challenging whenever you're at this scale, right? With millions of people coming to you and all these things. But, you know, what's cool about having audio rooms is like, I'm going to be on an audio room today with Arlen Hamilton talking to over a thousand people in our room. And they can always feel like they can talk to me. See? So what are some things that's not scaly? So you said events. Events is a good example. Um, signing them up to spreadsheets, putting them in. We had um we had telegram so this so I'll tell you this is how it ha happened in the beginning. People would come to our office, they would share what their goals were, what their pain points were, tell us the career that they wanted, and what timeline that they did. We would sign them up on a spreadsheet. We would put them in a Telegram group, which is kind of like Signal. Mm -hmm. Put them in a Telegram group, and then we would help them. We would, we would monitor them. We would like okay, apply to this school, apply to that school, get in and out. And then once we understood what the motion was, we actually cloned Telegram. And then we put profiles on top of it. Mm. And then we eventually like turned it into the basics of, of what we had in the beginning before it became a marketplace and all each other stuff. So you got all that. So at this point, like you said, most people don't, they raise money, but they forget that they have to make money. Mm -hmm. So how are you guys making money in the, yeah. in the early stages? Yeah, so we've always, uh, we've always wanted to think about when you're building a marketplace, which is the type of business that we're running, it's not an AI business, or we think about a marketplace, you have to pick a side. Like, who are you going to serve? Right? So we have workers on one side. And we have schools on another side. Both of them have some money. Right? Who are you going to charge? You can charge one or the other. You can charge both. So we're like, we actually don't want to charge workers nothing because they've already got $1.8 trillion in student loans. You know, a lot of them are already in debt. They've been played by so many people. We want to make sure that we build trust because, like, that's way more valuable than money. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. So... How are you going to make money, though? <laughs> right. So what we learn is that there's thousands of schools, not just in the U.S., but globally, and they spend billions of dollars a year to get enrollments. Like 
look at where we are right now. You probably heard about the Great Resignation, mm-hmm. right? We have over 10 million open jobs, 4 million people quitting jobs. And why are they quitting their jobs? Because they don't want to go back to the jobs that are in the factories that don't allow them to work from home and take advantage of remote work and be with their kids, right? They want to get these tech jobs. Um, and what's happening is the colleges, historically, when you have recessionary behavior, which we had, we're entering into year three of COVID, mm-hmm. right? You would see actually college enrollment going up because people want to go back to school in order to get a job that pays well. The problem is, is like people don't trust higher education no more. They don't want to pay 50000 a year to go to college if there's no guarantee of a job anymore. To be very clear, I'm not saying I'm anti-college, but college is starting to recognize that they need to innovate because they don't want their enrollments to stop, keep, keep dropping. So what they're doing is not just launching shorter, faster, and cheaper models that train you to get a job in three to 12 months, like Trilogy and, and things like that, and my home is at 2U and, and my home is at Chet. Um, they're spending a lot of money to attract students, um, not just on Google and Facebook, um, but also um, through virtual events and stuff like that. This is an interesting stat um, that Shema says. I, I don't know if it's still the same, but he says like 40 cents of every VC dollar raised goes to Google and Facebook. And that's paid advertising to attract users. And similar to, and the reason why people do this because there's so many apps that are out there in order to get users and get seen. You know, uh, zero to one says, you know, um, it says, um, uh, essentially, like when you build a product, um, dang, I'm messing up the quote, but essentially, like building the product is not enough. You have to actually get it out to people. And a lot of people think building a good product alone is what gets you where you want to go. And the last thing that I'm going to say here is just that uh, colleges and and boot camps started spending a lot of money in order to attract users. And so we decided, in order to make money, we would charge for every enrollment in the beginning to prove that it worked. So we charge about 10% of the tuition. So you're charging the schools? We charge the schools 10% for every enrollment of their tuition. Who, and the tuition would range between ten to 50000 a year. Yeah, Wait, so who, who's, the, who's the first school that you went after? Well, it's interesting. No. Yeah. So before YC, we started a podcast. And the first school was actually Hack Reactor. So Hack Reactor was a school that my, um, my co-founder, Archer, went to. And um, they were paying us 5,000 months, so it was about 60,000 a year. And we're like, wow, 60,000 a year from one school? Like, how, how much do other schools pay? And like, some schools pay hundreds of millions of dollars a year. And that's how we discovered this market. Mm-hmm. Um, and now that we're going to higher education, we're realizing that um, it's not just per enrollment, you wanna do it per introduction. So now we've moved to a per introduction model. So we could do like really interesting things like dynamic pricing. So if you're interested in a data science program, you might be interested in an economics degree or a math degree or statistics degree so we can charge different schools different prices based off of what the ind- individuals are interested study. in. Stuff like that. All yeah. right, so like if I'm going to NYU, the tuition is 60000 10% of that is going to you if I enroll, but that could be more if I decide to study, something like, else, yeah. like my, get my doctorate in something. Mm-hmm. Got you. So how do you put together your curriculum and what, what is your curriculum to actually get them trained? So we actually aren't a school at all. We are the platform that matches people to the curriculums. So where's the curriculum coming from? So we actually built a directory of 450 boot camps, 7,000 trade schools, colleges, and universities. So kind of like Glassdoor, what we've done is we've organized a directory of different schools, and we have reviews from other students that kind of like the Better Business Bureau to show that they're credible. Every student puts pros and cons about what's going on. They upload projects and they show ultimately where people are getting jobs by school. So when people come to Career Karma, if you go to careerkarma.com slash apply, you'll say what career path you're interested in or if you don't know. And let's say that you do say that what you're interested in. We'll recommend about three to five schools to you that are best for your desired timeline, and then you'll start talking to them, to those schools. You're usually not gonna make a decision about what school you wanna go to in the beginning because you're not gonna make a life-changing decision that fast. Mm-hmm. Then you're gonna start talking to people in our community that actually attended the, the schools so that you're not just hearing people just, I mean, if, if I wanna go to Rashad's co-school, of course you're gonna say you're the best, but you wanna talk to people that actually went through it. Right? 
And so usually it takes people about a month in order to make a decision about where they want to go. And then if you're doing something full time, it'll take you three to six months to get a job. Uh, if you're doing something part time, it's six to 12 months. And if you do something self paced, it's 12 to 24 months. So, but to your point, in our platform, we do have some like quizzes to like help you, like personality tests to understand what you're interested in. We do have a mini boot camp uh, where if you want to build a clone of YouTube, uh, we've done that as well, so you can do it, and that'll automatically get you accepted into different schools. Mm -hmm. But we never want to be a school. All right. So being a school is not how you create a monopoly in education. So you, the schools pay you to bring in people. Yeah. Right. They get training from you. Yeah. Uh, they match it, but the career part. So like after they complete it, now mm -hmm. they got to get the job. That's right. Are you still involved with yes. that process of them actually getting the job? Yes. So we we're, we're a career navigation platform. So we're the wraparound service around everything. And so um, it's interesting that you say this because the, the the guys that led our Series B is top tier capital partners. The people that led our Series A is uh, initialized capital. It's Gary Tan. Gary Tan actually built Bookface for Y Combinator, which is the internal um, directory for YC. And Gary calls Career Karma Y Combinator for the people where Y Combinator bets on first time founders and Career Karma bets on people for the first time. So not only do we want to... Well, you got to say that again. Yeah, let's, let's slow it down. Like that. you That's important. Down. That's good. <laughs> That's good. That's good stuff. Y Combinator bets on first-time founders and Career Karma bets on people for the first time. Thank you for letting, letting me catch that. <laughs> <laughs> and so what, what's interesting about it is, um, and I'm glad that you're calling this out, is we don't want people to think that we just send people to schools and we leave, leave them alone after. We want to be there with you before during and after the program and even after you're employed if you ever want to do something like start a company we could help you get connected to that or change company we can help you do that through our audio rooms so yes so i'll just add one one more thing because you said this is your quote you said this is probably the greatest reallocation of labor since world war ii that's right i want you to explain that quote man. that's right so during world war ii um what's very interesting about that is the government got involved and they created the um the GI Bill, right? So the GI Bill essentially um, paid for the education for veterans. Right now, obviously, the government's really focused on healthcare stuff. Mm -hmm. After that, you know, they've started touching on positive student loan payments or whatever. Uh, when Obama was in power, there was the WIOA Act, which is the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act. But like this real focus on reskilling hasn't happened yet, in my opinion. Something that the CEO of Check says, Dan Rosenzweig, I'm going to give him a shout out. He says, bet on the inevitable. In my opinion, it's going to be inevitable for government to get involved to help its citizens reskill. Why? Because every politician measures themselves on getting jobs for their different cities and countries and whatever. And so um, you're already starting to see different workforce uh, boards get involved with help laptop programs or skill programs or, or Wi-Fi hotspots. Um, and in my opinion, the student loan bubble will pop at some point and the cost of education will go down and will be primarily funded by government, philanthropy, and employers. I'll go, I'll go back to that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> guys, <sorry. laughs> you, you said that, um, you said how to monopolize education is not through a school. We'll talk about that. Yeah, so zero to one, this is very important to understand because like, something that people talk about is TAM, right? Total addressable market. So whenever you want to... What does that mean? So whenever you're raising a, starting a company and you're coming up with the idea for what you want to solve, if you want to build a billion dollar company, you want to build something that has an addressable market that's big enough. So... Let me give you an example. Let's say that you want to build an app for people that like to play polo. That world is small, right? The people that want to play polo. But the people that um, ride horses is probably bigger than that. I don't know if that's a billion dollar company. Or the people that um, play sports in general, mm -hmm. outside sports in general is much bigger. So that TAM is a lot larger. But, you know, there's riches and niches. Right, so you can start with the people that play polo if you're a polo player, because if you lock that down, then that allows you to take over all the outside sports. It's like polo. Right? Ralph Lauren polo. Exactly, exactly. And I was just in Argentina and I found out about La Delfina and all these other things like that. And so some of the reason why I bring this up is because 
The or, two, or, or Nike. Or Nike, right? Mm-hmm. Started as a running company. Exactly. And then they the expanded. Sports. They expanded, right? So similar to like with us, right? So the 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 two point six trillion dollar post secondary education and workforce market is massive, but the boot camp market is five hundred million, something like that. So in the beginning when we were raising, a big pushback is like that market is too small. So as a founder, you gotta be able to communicate our beachhead market take over boot camps and then take over the rest of the stuff why do we focus on boot camps because boot camps are the 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 fastest growing post-secondary education market uh model that traditional education players are copying and now you know fast forward to today everybody's copying it nobody knew the pandemic was going to hit the pandemic just proved us right and now you know we're the main player we're 16 times bigger than everybody else because of that Going back to the piece about monopoly, um, be careful about monopoly. Yeah. <laughs> in the book, it talks about um, it talks about um, if you want to build a company that dominates a market, um, you want to figure out a software solution that can be a layer across of across these things so think about like my father's a physician so he if you're gonna build a hospital you can't build a hospital that heals the entire world one hospital that heals the world because it's so complex right there's just so many different versions of cancer you're just not gonna do that with one hospital but you can build a platform that heals the world by connecting to every type of healthcare clinic and healthcare institution that serves people with various needs all over the world you see? And so if I want to help a billion people through Career Karma, which is our mission, we want to connect the world's talent to its next opportunity, then I can't do it by starting a school. As much as I, I love education, my sister's a teacher, I, I want to build a school, but I can't. that's not how I'm going to, I want to see this in my lifetime. I want to help a billion people in my lifetime. Mm-hmm. The only way I can do that is through software and connecting to the schools, connecting to companies and connecting to the people. You, know, the, you, you said employer pay tuition. Something that's coming in the future, mm-hmm. but most people are here that are like, oh, it's too costly. But it actually, it could be a benefit. You want, can you talk about why yeah. that, why employers should be actually thinking this model before this, which it, it segues into it. So when I was in Demo Day, not only did I talk about that we launched in traction, I talked about how 375 million workers are going to switch careers between now and 2030, um, and instead of going back to college, they're going to go to job training programs to find the next jobs. I talked about how income share agreements are changing the landscape. What does that mean? It means that um, historically when people go to school, they either pay for it out of pocket, Mm -hmm. they take out a loan, or they get government funding, or they get a scholarship. There are two things called income share agreements and deferred tuition. So income share agreements and deferred tuition are a promise where it says, hey Troy, I promise I'm gonna get you a job. If you don't get a job through my training, you don't have to pay me anything. But if you do get a job that's in the lane that you want to be in, then the tuition comes out of your new salary up to whatever maximum that I tell you, right? Mm -hmm. And what's cool about that is like, literally you can try any type of education that you want to. And if you don't get a job, you don't pay anything. And so most of the people that come to Career Karma, they do either an income share agreement or deferred tuition option. Okay, now the employer thing is very interesting. Because it also fits into the great resignation stuff. Um, em- employees have the power and contractors have the power these days. And uh, what a lot of employers are starting to do, part of the reason why employers pay for your health care, which is the big reason why people go there, is because you know people will work in factories and things like that. And if they get injured, they, you know, and people want to have start families and retire and things like that. That's why they would do that to attract you to, to join the company. Since people aren't just going to school for four years and being there forever, um, companies are actually starting to get involved to make sure that they're funding your ongoing training so you don't have to pay for it. And so you see like Amazon paying $700 million for warehouse workers so that they can get their tuition paid for. You see PwC putting $3 billion towards this. You see um, AT&T putting a billion towards this. Macy's, Walmart, all these people are starting to get involved because everybody's going digital. Target, look at Target's like digital numbers. It's going crazy. Domino's digital numbers are going crazy. Mm-hmm. It's not just tech companies. And so um, 
the World Economic Forum, uh, they just made a big pledge to reskill a billion people by 2030 with companies, governments, and philanthropies. And I was like, that's my mission too. And there's another really cool organization called 110.org that was started by Ken Chenault, former CEO of American Express, also a black dude, which we got a shout out. Um, and he um, he's also on the board of Guild Education, which is the pioneer mm-hmm. in education as a benefit. I'll give a hat tip to that. Shout out to Rachel. Um, and they're doing really amazing things on the enterprise side. Um, so, yeah. So as far as, all right, so you just closed the B round. So when you're raising this money, like you hear in the news, like you raised $40 million, what does that actually mean as far as like how much of that is going to get allocated towards like infrastructure, employees, like when people raise that kind of money, like a broad overview, or you could speak specifically to your situation either, or like where does that money go? And um, like you said, each round, I guess it dilutes the ownership, right? It can. Okay. Depends on how much leverage you got. Okay. So, like, you start off with a company, you have 100% ownership, right? Yeah. Then you have the Less. family and friends round, and then you might give up, like, 10% to family and friends. Maybe. I'm just using an example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, or you could give the example of, like, what's usually typical. Keep going, keep going. No. And then, like, pre-seed, you give another 10%, right? So, now you got 80. You gave up 20% now. I would, I, I would, so, I would just say, like, Every round, there's dilution, but it, it's not always that extreme. Okay. I think like um, you could ex- you could definitely expect to still have most of your company by the B stage for most people if you played it right. More than fifty percent. You so for for a lot of people, but yeah. some people, a lot of people don't end up like that. What could they give up too much early or? Yeah. So. All right. What's a what's a good amount to give up? Depends. Like it's it's, it's kind of like raising raising salad. Like there are def- definitely different. Like it depends on the industry that you're in. Depends on the market. Depends on the investors. Um, how much you need money too? How much you need money? Yeah. How mm-hmm. desperate you are. Yeah. The best time to raise money is when you don't need money, right? So like for example, it's valuable. So like for, no, let, no, that, let, that's, let, that's valuable. Let, let me let me give you an example. That's valuable, right? Bro. So when we raised our Series A, so we finish we finish. I told you I raised half a million. I did a demo day. I raised 1.5, right? So, pandemic hit. Market's dry. Everybody's telling me, yo, you got to keep 18 to 24 months of, of reserves of reserves because nobody's cutting checks. So, we had to get scrappy, and we got profitable. And we were profitable for five months. So, when I raised money at the end of 2020, um... I still had a million in the bank out of the 1.5 that I raised, and I had 45 people working for the company. So you have leverage, right? They're like, oh, he's capital efficient. With that said, you also get the flip side where some investors be like, oh, you're too capital efficient because you're not investing in your growth. Mm. And you're supposed to not be profitable. Right? So it really depends on who you're talking to. Um, but we've always been like that. We've, same, same thing with this, with this round. Um, when we raised the Series B, we only spent three million out of the ten million that we raised, and we had about one hundred fifty people working for the company at the time. So, yeah, I mean, because even us, we've been approached from like different people, like interested in, in buying. It's like fortunately for us, we didn't need the money, um, so I was like, you know, we're not really interested. That's the best way to to raise right there. Yeah, when you don't need it. When you don't need it, and like even even now, so this is this is another thing it's important to do though. But you keep those people close, right? You mm-hmm. still talk to them, check in with them every quarter. So like we just raised this round, so of course, all the investors are gonna start hitting you up. Make sure you check in with them every quarter, even now talking about what's gonna come next, and tell them what you're gonna do, and then just make sure that every time you catch up with them, don't tell them everything that's going on with your business, but make sure you tell them that you're making progress. So. You create the FOMO, right? Okay. And I've I've done this four times now. You know the next one's gonna be big. So, <laughs> so well, you saw the last one was forty, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so the 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 forty, obviously, I mean, maybe it was a goal. That was the number that you wanted to reach. I started off at wanting to raise thirty, by the way. You wanted to raise thirty, yeah. and so uh, I, you have stages of development. So you, obviously, you started out as career advice service. So. Let's talk about the careers, of the the pathways that you have in in terms of development, and are you allocating the amount that you need for each stage? Is that how it's working? That's a good question. 
Um, because I was gonna ask answer his question about how it's allocated. Oh yeah, we so, but no, no, but that fits. That yeah. fits. That's perfect. Um, we currently have seven different career paths. Um, let's see if I remember all of them: software engineering, sales, design, data science, data analytics, cybersecurity, product management. I think maybe even more marketing as well. So we're still we're always launching new things, new things for people. Um, you asked about the biggest challenges right now. So um, the majority of the capital is going towards hiring, right? Going back to um, this is a employees market. Uh, you need to be competitive in the market. Tech people get paid very well, so I got to make sure my people are paid very well, and they have their benefits and they have their other things as well. And since you're attracting really, really talented people, uh, shout out to our VP people, Jessica Lamb. Um, you have to make sure that like uh, their competency modeling is done, so they have internal career paths. They know what they need to do in order to get rewarded and and things like that. So um, now that we have three million people a month coming to us, it's very important for us to invest in data. We actually want to grow to fifty million people a month organically in the next two years. So our data needs are going to have to not just segment users by level of intent, like how bad do you want this, high, medium, low intent. What interests do you have? What struggles are you dealing with? Good credit, bad credit. Do you have money? Do you not have money? Have you tried learning how to code? Have you not? Once you segment everybody, then you need to design specific pathways for everybody. The example that I gave him was if you're on Amazon, your homepage is going to be different than my homepage because we have different interests, mm -hmm. right? And same thing, if we have different interests and careers, we got to make sure that your flows are unique to who you are. And um, so we got to invest in that. Um, and then once we've invested in design and data, then we got to start investing in, in into product. So, yeah. So, what's the scalable model like going forward to actually get to that billion dollar level for you? Is just continue the path that you're on right now? Or? Continuing the path that we're on gets us to the billion dollar level, but we don't want to be a billion dollar company. We want to be a ten or hundred billion dollar company, right? So, eventually going public. Yes. Absolutely. So, what's the what's the what's the all right. What's the pathway to, for you to go public? You got to get to 100 million a year. 100 million a year? 100 million a year. You can't go public without making 100 million a year? You can. But you, that, can. you just want to go make 100 million? Because yeah. you, you could even go the SPAC route, right? Yeah, you could go SPAC route. You could go SPAC route. Um, I'm not rushing it, right? Like, I, like I'm blessed to, we're blessed to have investors, which we'll talk about in a second, that um, have very deep pockets that are, that can invest in us all the way to IPO. So that's, that's a really cool position to be in. Um, and I, and we wanna make sure that we have a strong foundation, right? There's a lot of stuff that's like not real out here. A lot of people that's just all headlines. I don't wanna be all headlines. I actually wanna be helping people. I actually want people getting jobs like, like your boy that made this whole podcast happen. We're creating a movement, right? There are real people on the ground that are doing their thing that are now leaders out here like one of our other investors is the the Winklevoss twins the the first they're out here you might the, have heard of them yeah you might have heard of them yeah. <laughs> the, the, the first the first person that we placed in career come was a guy named Jarek Warren at Gemini he got a job making 145,000 black man single dad um, he's the one who connected me to them and I like I didn't even ask him he volunteered it uh, Keisha Lake who we got at Stitch Fix now she Stitch Fix CEO Katrina Lake is a uh, billionaire she also became an investor in a company so it's just like through people like actually looking out for people you do so but to answer your question about how you go beyond a billion to ten hundred billion you have to understand the market the total addressable market what we're doing will get us to a billion dollar company but in order to really start getting into the bigger scale right if i want to be a ten billion dollar company i have to make like a billion a year right mm -hmm. and then 10 billion a year to be a hundred billion dollar company. So how do you do that? The enterprise. So um, a lot of investors really like investing into SaaS companies. So software as a service companies and recurring revenue contracts. So um, if you go to careercomedy.com slash company slash jobs, you'll see all of our open roles. I'm actively hiring a head of finance and a head of business development that will both report to me. And that head of business development is going to be the individual that I work with, with my co-founders and team, to take over the entire Fortune 1000 and help them 
attract, retain, and upskill their workforces uh, by offering career karma as a benefit to them. A good a good way to think about it is think about all these gig economy companies with millions of workers that drive but don't want to be in those jobs forever. We can offer career karma as a benefit. The company pays for it, and then they get jobs at the end. Huge. All users for career karma. It's free for the company, actually. The mm-hmm. schools still pay us. Boom. Right. A lot of really interesting things like that. So the, the marketing, right, because I'm thinking like social media, obviously, is a big marketing place. And is the marketing kind of word of mouth and then the product that you're actually giving is the is the marketing plan? Because I'm thinking like even if, like, if we did a SEO, when I put in career comment, if I put the wrong letter, it might give me credit comment. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. like what? How, how does the marketing go? How you go about it? So my co-founder, Archer, uh, he's our chief technology officer, but also he's in charge of the SEO. For people that don't know what SEO is, it's very important to understand. I'm glad that you're bringing it up. It's search engine optimization. When we talked about paid marketing to Google and Facebook or Instagram or whatever, which we do, that's called SEM, search engine marketing. But SEO is organic traffic. So we get millions of dollars of free traffic. And you gave the credit karma example. If I was in the fintech space, you know, the the fat head keywords, you probably heard of the long tail, or like just type credit card in Google and that's what's gonna pop up. Mm-hmm. You wanna find like the real hard to search terms and like really be the thing that pops up for all those like random things like an answer to a Python or a JavaScript question and your article pops up. And as you start establishing a domain authority, then you eventually can take over the the more popular keywords. Our team produces about 200 to 700 articles a month mm. on SEO. Okay. Um, we do podcasts like this, which helps. We do video. We do all kinds of things like that. Um, we put out research reports that are backlinked to dot .orgs and dot .govs, which establishes our domain authority, which is why we're going to continue to win. But then also we leverage programmatic landing pages. So if you put this school versus that school, our pages will pop up. Eventually it'll be this company versus that company. If you type in Google today, do it today, how to get a job at Goldman Sachs, you'll see career coming pops up there. So what do you think we're going to do? We're going to make listicles like top companies that pay for your tuition career karma we're going to dominate that whole thing in every other type of ancillary term so that as people are searching it they get discovered the problem with seo i would say it's necessarily an entire problem is that you're only gonna attract people that know what to look for so Mm -hmm. you need paid as well to reach people because like we we, we're trying you can't spread the gospel to people that know the gospel already Right, so you gotta like actually be out there. Yeah, the person that's there. typing career is actually thinking about their yeah. career. And you're gonna pop yeah. up, and that's why you're doing this, right? Yeah. Like you're doing this to educate people about what's going on, because the people that you're trying to reach that you really want listening to this don't know what to search. So what's the like? If who's the ideal candidate for career karma? Like, yeah, who should go to careerkarma.com? What a great question. So when I talk to investors, I say it's blue collar workers between the age of 25 and 35 years old who want to get a job in tech. But the real answer is like anybody that wants to make a career transition, usually 21 and up, uh, because I don't want to be encouraging people to drop out of high school if they're already in high school, even though this can get you a job. And we do have 16, 17, and 18 year olds that have gone through the process and gotten a job. Usually it's going to be an adult that's in a job that they don't want. They come to us and then we match them into something, mostly a part-time program, and they get a job like that. Lanise Powell is a very good example here in New York. Uh, she's in Brooklyn. Um, she was a teacher. She's a mom. She um, she did she did go to college, but she didn't want to go back to college, and she wanted to go to boot camp part-time. She joined um, and then got a job making 100000 at a company called New Zello, and she's doing very well. So, yeah. So, and so you did... There's a cost or the cost is, is from the employer? It's a good question. So career comm is always free. So we will never charge anybody anything. If you want to go to school, there are free courses that are in career comm. Think about the free courses kind of like going to the gym without a personal trainer and without a nutritionist and stuff like that. There's plenty of open things like that, but most people still need guidance and things like that. So most people will sign up to a boot camp. And a boot camp is 
going to have that option that I told you where you don't have to pay anything unless you get a job. So a lot of people will do a little sign up. If they don't get a job, they don't pay anything. If you finish and you get a job that's in the range that you're going for, it's usually going to be in the seventy to one hundred fifty thousand plus range, and then the tuition will range between ten to thirty thousand. So my brother's a good example. When he got his job, it was one hundred fifty thousand. He paid out twenty six, and that's how it works. Oh, uh, the salary of the salary it comes out of like your it paycheck. Come, it comes out of your salary, yeah. Until exactly. it's paid off. Until it's paid off, yeah. Pretty efficient. Okay. So, 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 who are some of the, the investors? All right, obviously, you had a series of rounds, and now we did the forty million. Who were some of the people that have invested into mm-hmm. the company? And more importantly, why we didn't get a call? No, just <laughs> who, who, are, who are the investors? Going forward, you guys will always get a call. Yeah, we was left. We was left, left out. out. <laughs> was left out. We'll talk about that after. Cap table. Next round. <laughs> Next round. Um, Google Ventures, uh, Initialized Capital, SoftBank. Um, Bronze, um, K Port. So we have over fifty investors. Uh, we actually put together. We actually did something special this round where we like put together a video. Um, most of our, our investors are women and people of color, and it's one thing to like write that down, but it's another thing for you all to see it. So in December, I asked everybody to send uh, short video clips um, about why they invested in career karma for reasons deeper than money. And you guys know Nana, so. Shout out to oh, Nana. Yeah, yeah. So Nana literally. You know her? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I think she told me about you too. Yeah. Nana did like all of our videos. So she took all the videos, chopped it up, and put it together like a Super Bowl ad pretty much. And it's fire. <laughs> and like it took off. Is Baron Davis investor? Baron Davis investor. So uh, that, that's exactly right. So Baron Davis is an investor. Another person that didn't mention it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so you did. He went up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Baron Davis is an investor. So Larry. So there's a bunch of different athletes and, and, and angels. Um, but um, it was very important for us to have people that look like us that are investing in the in the platform. John Henry, who who you guys know? So. John Henry invested. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, I'm confused. I'm confused why we wasn't we wasn't involved in this. It's gonna happen. It's gonna John, happen. <laughs> it would have been it would have been a good look. He kept us out the loop next time. <laughs> All fun and I see what you did. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, are you gonna raise any more money or? Yeah. How much more? You think? It'll be big. It'll be big. <laughs> Don't miss the next round. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be big. You saw what I did the last. But we time. have time. Like we have time. Like like with this money, like we have over three years of runway. So um, so this money will last you three years at least. Um, but I mean, the last money also did too. You just never know, like what happens. You know. Are so. you are you profitable? Not right now. So talk about We're that because that's something growth. that people don't fully understand either. Like a lot of these companies aren't profitable or even just became profitable like even companies that's listed on the stock market yep, yep. major companies Uber like, just might be yeah, profitable like spend. yeah um and people don't fully understand it like how could a company like uber you know at least a couple of years ago not be profitable mm-hmm. when it's one of the biggest companies in the world and these guys are billionaires and like but talk about that like how you don't necessarily have to be profitable yeah talk about because like i said people don't understand that it's important for you to understand your path to profitability, right? Similar to like how we knew what we had to do in order to get profitable, and we did it. And now that we have capital, revenue, and customers and workers coming to us, we can invest into our growth. So going back to what I said in the beginning, the main difference between startups and everything else is growth. And these tech companies that you're seeing that are public or private are attacking legacy industries that have been around for hundreds of years, Mm -hmm. 50 years, blah, blah. So the way to dominate is by moving faster than they can ever move. And that usually requires capital. And like some people will go from 200 to 1,000 people in a year. That's a lot. In addition to executing and shipping products and doing all kinds of stuff. And so um, it really just depends on who's backing you. So, um, and and whether you're actually solving the problem that you said that you are going to solve. And if, you, if you're demonstrating those things and you're telling the right story and you're actually executing behind the story, you'll be able to raise it. You'll be able to raise the money that you need or, or be able to, to stay um, relevant. What I'll say is um, it's very important to um, choose your investors wisely. Because some people will cause you to grow 
too fast to where you run yourself into the ground. Um, so we've, we've been blessed to where, you know, I don't have no problem with none of our board members, none of our investors, period. They all got our back. And they definitely push us and they ask us questions and they, they hold us accountable, but they don't force us to, like, run ourselves into the ground. And so I say that just because, like, there are strings to capital um, that are good and bad. You you so spoke about uh, board members and like yeah. so most people we probably I don't think we've ever had that conversation the process of actually choosing them and actually the power that they have like people probably watch Succession or Billions and they're like oh that's the board they're gonna they're gonna vote them out what's that process like in in choosing them because you're you're actually choosing the people correct yes that could end ultimately throw the, you out the the board can fire you yeah the board can fire you um whenever you're raising money. You want to be mindful of economics, which we talked about a little bit on valuation and dilution, but also control. Um, and the control is like board. If you lose control of the board, you lose everything. Um, we didn't have a board until our Series A, which I don't think anybody really needs a board until there because now you're actually really making money and you need that type of guidance. Think about, let's talk about the good parts of a board. The good parts of a board is like you want to have people on your board that you would never be able to hire that can help you. So for example, Gary Tan, he runs Initialize Capital. That's an over $200 billion portfolio. It includes Instacart and Rippling. He was first checking Coinbase, for example, mm. um, $100 billion outcome. Um, and he really has seen this many, many times before, and he's able to guide us on what we got to do. One of his LPs, Top Tier Capital Partners, uh, which is people that give him money to start his fund, they invested in our Series B round, so they've seen not only what he's seen, but also from investing in other companies, they're able to give you that OG knowledge. Um, I think Wallow from Million Dollars Worth of Game, he said, um, or, or Gilly, one of them said, um, an OG is, is, is someone that offers you game, right? So you want people that are offering you game and giving you guidance and, and keeping you focused because what happens when you start winning is you get all kinds of opportunities that are presented to you and you can do all kinds of things and it's up to you to decide whether you want to stay focused on your path or get distracted and ultimately most of the time the right decision is to stay focused on what you're currently doing because it compounds there you have it ladies and gentlemen Ruben <laughs> thank you guys I'm calling it a classic man <laughs> definitely a very informative episode uh, what would you like to tell the people like um you know, social media, what you have going on that they can look forward to. If you guys want to go to Career Karma, if you guys want to get a job in tech, go to careercarma.com slash apply. Um, download the app. Um, if you want to speak with someone because you're a little nervous, just go to careercarma.com slash events. Uh, we have a big event going on today. Um, if you want to send me an email, it's just Ruben, R-U-B-E-N, at careercarma.com. I'm on Twitter and Instagram, Ruben Harris, R-U-B-E-N-H-A-R-R-I-S. Pay attention to what these guys are doing, especially EYL University. I'm actually very excited about what you guys are doing there. The reason why is because, you know, it's not just boot camps that are teaching. It's not just corporations that are teaching. It's not just colleges and post-secondary that's, that's teaching. It's individuals that are teaching. You guys are using a platform for it. There's a guy like Lenny Ruchinski that's growing. There's a really good article that came out in the Wall Street Journal about uh, teachers in Korea that are making over $4 million a year just by teaching. I think the biggest educator will be the individual. And this whole podcast is an education platform. So make sure you hit subscribe, tap in. Um, we also have a podcast called Breaking into Startups that has a lot of stories that you all should check out. And um, that's it. And we'll, we'll, we'll be part of you guys. Uh, we'll do some collaborative in-person events. We're talking about it right now, so stay tuned for that. Yeah. Stay tuned. Stay, stay tuned. tuned. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Troy, housekeeping items? Yeah, well, shout out to the island of Jamaica. Shout out to the island yeah. of Cuba yes. as well. I know we you have here. Cuba and have Jamaica. Yes, sir. Always got to show love to the fam. Yes, sir. And I shout out to everybody that's part of EYL University. Shout out to all our Patreon members. Uh, we got over 12,000 people in EYL University. That's big. Yeah, it's, that's big. Yeah, that's a movement. Something we're really proud of. So shout out to all our earners. And um, shout out to everybody that's supporting the merch. Uh, we got new stuff on the way. So I'm about uh, yeah. the cops on right now. Oh, don't worry about it, man. You're alumni now. <laughs> Send your care package. <laughs> so uh, we appreciate y'all. Love is love. Love is love. All right, guys. Thank you for rocking with us. We'll see you next week. Peace. Peace. Out. My graduates from my school being Forbes backdrop.
Backdrop. <laughs> a mic drop. Backdrop. Backdrop. <laughs>